my screen. And um, we'll see how it goes. Uh, I'm basically going to sketch out some stuff for you all and describe like why I, I wrote the book. So, um, so again, a little bit about myself. Um, David G. Bland, I'm out here on, on the West Coast, California, Northern California, uh, in the Bay Area for about 10 years, and then um, recently a little further outside the Bay Area, but still out here in Northern California. Um, first 10 years of my career were at startups, and then the last 10 years of my career have been at uh, really just consulting and advising. And so I think I have an interesting mix of percep like perspectives on, on things. And um, I do work in the government space here and there. Um, and so we'll see if how this uh, lands with you all. So um, basically, I wrote this book. Oh, sorry, we're getting some noise. Um, if you all can mute too. Um, so basically, I wrote this um, to really just help people that were stuck on um, how to look at risk and then what to do before kind of building the whole thing. And so whether that be a service or a business or a product or whatever that is, you know, I feel like some teams would just jump to build far too soon and, and they would um, really find out if they're right or wrong in kind of the most expensive way possible. Um, and so really what I'm trying to do with you all here today is just help you de-risk your kind of business and product or, or service ideas um, to give you some ways of thinking um, and, and some ways to look at things and hopefully give you more options where you feel like you're up at night worried about something and you're not sure what action to take. So hopefully today I'll help you all out. And then I do have a code of conduct. Basically it's the Bill and Ted code of conduct, which is be, ex be excellent to one another. So essentially um, anything that we do share out, please be respectful in tone and, and dis disagreement is fine as long as it's uh, no personal attacks. So um, I'm going to start over here with uh, sort of this framing, that's sort of my guiding principles to how I approach um, approach this work, and, and I'll sketch some stuff out for you all too. But basically, um, I you know I went to school for design uh, before I got pulled into kind of startup life, and you know one of the things that really resonated with me was just you know how to have you know empathy and have uh, design for a need or a job to be done, um, and I felt like. This framing um, that I first learned at IDEO, but you know, if you trace the the this thread back, it goes through uh, Stanford D School and then Larry Keeley and Institute of Design in Chicago. But basically, this idea of kind of desirability. So you know, is it desirable? Do they want this? Does it solve a, a meaningful job or alleviate a pain or create a gain that that customers are looking for? Viability being kind of the should we question now. You should have a moral compass, obviously, and be ethical in, in your business and policy decisions. Also, it needs to sustain in some way. It needs to be funded in some way. Even if it's a nonprofit, you know, you have to show impact to get funding from, from others. And so this kind of should we question, you know, um, of course, it includes ethics, but also I'm more focused on the, um, like the impact you're having, the uh, cost that it takes to achieve that impact. And then feasible, which is more feasibility, is sort of this can we question. And I know if you look at sort of recent write-ups on this, the can we question is often around just technical feasibility. But I think it's much more than that. I think it's especially regulatory governance. You know, all the startups I worked at were in, in heavily regulated industries. And uh, just because we could do something didn't mean we were necessarily allowed to do it, right? So... Uh, the first startup I joined, we were transferring money online. And um, here in the United States, right, we have to clear that money through DTCC, who's been in the news a lot lately for crypto and, and Robin and a lot of other things. But even back then, uh, we had to clear the money through DTCC. Uh, or uh, just because our platform worked, it didn't mean it was um, allowed to work. Right, So we weren't, weren't allowed to transfer the money and clear it if we hadn't worked through regulatory bodies such as Accord and, and DTCC. So when you start looking at sort of these themes, I feel like they hold up really well because if you miss one, then you're in trouble. Uh, so for example, if it's feasible, you can do it, but it's not desirable. Then you run into issues where you've built something, but you're just frantically trying to find a market for it. And, and then before you run out of money or run out of funding. For um, desirability, like if you focus there and it's something people do want, 
but then feasibility you can't do it you're not allowed or it doesn't work or it doesn't meet expectations then you fail and i think um, we could point to a lot of crowdfunding in, in this regard uh, i think we've all seen crowdfunding or even funded things ourselves that looked amazing in that explainer video and yet when we uh, funded it they always get these updates like oh i, I uh was traveling last week or i was working on the perks or you know there's always these like sporadic they get fewer and fewer right and then and then it just dies and then um you know viability obviously like even if you have something that is desirable uh that people want and you can do it but uh you can't make it work from a viability point of view that still fails and i think we can point to a lot of products that are no longer around that we really loved they're usually not uh, no longer around because they uh weren't viable so, or they'd have a viable business model. And so when you start thinking about folks who can answer, you know, these types of questions, and when you think about something like, um, let's let's go with desirability for now. So, you know, a lot of the inspiration can, can come from design, right? Um, and, and researchers. So uh, also other, it could be sales, it could be marketing. Um, but basically, what are some of the roles that you might bring into the room to have a conversation about, is this desirable? Do we have any observable evidence that it's that it's desirable? And then when you're working on viability, right? Um, the people I like to bring into the room are often product folks um, that understand, okay, uh, what, what does this look like from a strategic point of view? Um, it could also be, um, you know, finance. I'll uh, scroll out a little bit for you. So it could be also be finance. And then on the backstage, when you think about, can you do it? You know, um, obviously there's, there's some that jump out, you know, one would be tech, right? Having tech leadership in the room, but also having legal, um, you know, a lot of times when I'm working in the heavily regulatory, uh, regula regulated spaces, we have to bring in uh, safety and compliance or legal. And so overall, just be thinking through as we answer these questions, you know, and we want to uh, like any good Venn diagram, right? You want to kind of be here. Um, you need to have folks in the room that can answer these. Now in Agile, right, this has been framed different ways. It's called the trio, I've heard it, or the triad, or, uh, you know, this is really kind of the beginnings of a lot of the cross-functional movement. Uh, we have to have product design engineering together, um, but it can be more than that, especially if you're working with policy, um, but having the right people in the room makes uh, all the difference because if you skew towards one, then quite often you, you know, your risk might look all like desirability risk. But if you only had invited maybe legal in, you would have understood that, oh, there's this regulation preventing us from, from doing this. So overall, that might be riskier than, than people wanting it. So overall, I love this kind of framing. Um, you know, I work with a lot of different types of businesses and governments and um, quite often these hold up no matter what industry I, I'm working in. Uh, because like I said, th th these principles are really, really important. And if you skip one, then you fail in a big way, not in a small way. And so uh, what we've been doing, and I customized this talk for all of you today, um, is we've been overlaying this thinking, um, myself and uh, Alexander Osterwalder, on, on the tools that, um, that we use. So this is uh, a variation of the business model canvas that Alex created. Um, who's my co-author in testing business ideas. And uh, it's called the Mission Model Canvas. And, and so I use this if I'm working with nonprofits or if I'm working with governments, state, local, federal. And I find that um, it helps frame the conversation in a way where we can look at risk and then we can design experiments to, to address that risk. And so it's probably the lesser known of the canvases. I think most everyone knows about the Business Model Canvas or, or even the Lean Canvas, which is... Um, uh, an adaptation of the business model canvas by Ash Maria. But this one, uh, Steve Blank helped create. Um, so he's kind of like the godfather, I would say, of Lean Startup. Uh, Eric Ries was in his class, and and this is how kind of Lean Startup book came to be. Um, but he modified it for the I-Corps program here uh, for National Science Foundation. And so uh, I, I really like this framing because um, it helps you sort of uh, think more about impact than just a for-profit business. Obviously, my book is focused more on for-profit, but I have a link of how to use this and how I use it with mapping too, which I'll have for you at the end of this workshop today. But um, basically, desirability, 
you know, layering this thinking on it's your value prop, your beneficiaries, your deployment, your kind of buy-in viability kind of at the bottom here. So you're looking at your uh, achievement, your impact, right? And then your cost, your like mission budget, and then feasibility being like your activities and resources and, and partners. And so when you start thinking through like the flow of something like this, and help people sketch out their strategy, you know, like who are beneficiaries? That's pretty important knowing like who you're actually trying to serve. Um, what's your value proposition to them? Now, it may not be the thing, right? So here, right, um, like the US is we're trying to get vaccinated. And so the website is like you could easily put that as a product in the middle. But really, people don't care about the website. They just want their appointment to get, you know, vaccinated. So it's much more about the value prop of scheduling and making sure you can trust it you know so i would challenge you to not just load up that middle box with a bunch of your products or whatever it is you're offering it's it's the benefit of it it's the perceived benefit reward of, of using it and then how do you deploy it okay and then how do you get buy-in and support so you'll notice i don't go left or right at all um you can but i i almost never do I'm usually working on the right side of this tool first to say, okay, we have a lot of desirability risk. Let's start mapping out what these relationships are. So I do not treat this like as a bunch of checkboxes. I think that's a very limited use of, of the tool. And then how do you achieve your uh, impact, right? Now on the back side, you think through, okay, so what are the activities? So think verbs, the key verbs. It's not every activity you have because there are probably thousands of them, but just what are the, the main ones? And then what are the resources? So think nouns, think physical, digital, uh, could be patents, could be people, <laughs> you know, could be some sort of uh, technology, right? Um, and then what does that cost? And then who do you partner with? And so uh, I make this, I'll have to make tell the story that when I first introduced this tool to something like, uh, uh, I don't know, I was working with the IMF here in, 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 in uh, Washington, D.C. And, uh, you know, it's like, oh, there's there's a flow to this, you know, there's there's a way this stuff flows around, right? And, and so you start to understand, oh, okay, my value prop, you know, I have to be able to deploy that. I have to build buy-in and support. So that's more of a bi-directional kind of thing. My beneficiaries, like, I have to be able to measure the impact that I'm having. And then on the backstage, you're looking at activities and resources and saying, oh, okay, here's my cost, because I can look at activities and resources and understand my costs. And then if I partner with somebody, they're probably bringing an activity that I can't do or a resource that I don't have, or they might even be helping me deploy. And so when you start looking at the tool this way, you can start seeing the relationships. And so if something happens, let's say, you can't deploy through a certain channel for whatever reason. Well, what does that do to the rest of your model? You know, do you do you change uh, your beneficiaries? Do you change like like how uh, what are the ripple effects? You know, if you if you change your beneficiaries, let's say you did that. What does that do to your value prop or your impact? And and so I view this much more as almost like a systems thinking tool. <laughs> but uh, I think when it's viewed as a canvas, people look at it as a static thing. They just check the box and go, yep, have a value prop. I, I think if you use it that way, it's not going to help so much. Um, I mean, you'll know all the components that make up, you know, your model. But I think being able to see the relationships is kind of the superpower and be able to tell a story. That That's what I, I focus on. And so from there, um, what I tend to do is we start writing down what are our assumptions. And so you'll notice here, I like using uh, different colors. So, for example, um, I use this kind of like we believe format. And so for desirability, I use uh, orange. For viability, I use green. And then for feasibility, I use blue. And with that, um, I like starting with we believe. Uh, it's kind of might, might sound a bit silly, but I like people writing things down in a way where they're open to the fact that they might be wrong, that it's a belief. And so if, if that's... Um, it's a small win, right? A mindset change. It's a small win. If they can write these down in this format, then when we go to map them, it ends up being, oh, well, do we have evidence or not for this like kind of assumption that we have? And and so um, I have this little two by two. Want to write them down? Uh, I have this two by two that um, that I created called uh, assumptions mapping. And when I first learned this, um, 
or version of this was was working with Jeff Gothelf and Josh Seiden at Neo. Uh, they wrote this book called Lean UX. It's really popular. And they had amazing um, two by two in that book. I just had a hard time my, with my teams, like the axes and labels and and there was still something missing. And so what I just kept doing was um, testing it with like hundreds of teams over the years and ended up with uh, pulling design thinking in and then changing sort of the um, the labels. And so what ended up working for me and all my teams has, has been how important is this? So important to our success. Uh, and then um, how much evidence do we have observable, uh, observable evidence? So qualitative and quantitative. And so what happens is you gotta get your team to say, okay, well, we wrote these down, that's cool. Now let's bring one over. How important is this assumption to us succeeding? Now, some of you might say, well, I only wrote down the most important stuff, so it shouldn't be down here. You'd be surprised uh, when I facilitate this, sometimes stuff ends up below the line, even though we said it was important and we framed it that way. But overall people go, oh, well, this is really important because it's about the beneficiary. And then I'll say, well, do you have any evidence to support it? And we'll say, well, no, we haven't talked to any beneficiaries. So that would go way over here. <laughs> that would be important and, and no evidence whatsoever. And then when you pull another one over, you could say, okay, so compared to this one, is it more or less important? And do we have more or less evidence? And we're like, well, but this one with our value prop, we think we have some more evidence um, that overall it, it, it could be, um, it could resonate. And so what you end up doing is you start kind of pulling these over and it's really interesting. You end up with this like, kind of little map. And the most important part of the map, I feel, is um, this kind of upper right part. Because this quadrant is more around, well, we all agree that these were assumptions that we were making. And so which ones are um, like the most important where we have no evidence? And, and so one of the ways I kind of frame this is, all right. So once you have this conversation and, and I do recommend talking when you do this, you don't want one person just deciding how important everything is. Um, you do want to have a conversation. And so I tend to ignore anything down here. And I say, look, uh, if it's below the line, just ignore it for now. Um, over here on the left, I say, well, if we have this stuff, whoops, um, I write a little better here. Um, if we have this stuff in the, in the left, um, Sorry, it's not, uh, it's lagging a little bit. Anyway, um, basically it's just share. <laughs> it's, it's lagging, so hold on a second. Yeah, it, uh, it completely lagged out when I tried to do that. <laughs> My bad, it's, it's the app, I think. Um, you just share the top left and then in the top right, um, is it gonna catch up? <laughs> there we go. Um, in the top right, we, we, want to, um, we want to experiment. Okay, so share this stuff and then, and then basically um, ignore everything below here and then um, take the top right and say, okay, these are the things that are most important where you have the least amount of evidence. So let's take those and then run experiments for those. Uh, and, and it's something I learned uh, the hard way in, in a lot of my early work was we got teams excited about experimentation and then they just sort of ran experiments because they were fun or they wanted to learn how to do the experiment. And unfortunately that did not yield to de-risking the opportunities and overall they kind of failed. And, and so they failed in a big way because they were giving the illusion of progress by running experiments, but they weren't focused on the most important things where they had the least amount of evidence. So having learned the hard way, um, I tend to say, well, focus on the stuff where you don't have evidence and it's really important, like leap of faith assumption sort of importance here. So um, what we did is we wrote a book uh, and we inc included 44 different experiments. And basically the way we frame these, which I thought was really interesting, was so how do you choose um, what experiment to run? And that has been one of my challenges I face in all the advising work I do, because I'm usually only working on real stuff. I don't usually do training for training purposes, so to speak. I do it like twice a year. <laughs> I have actually one this month with uh, Alex. We're doing a three day masterclass, which is like anybody can join. Right. And we have uh, it's almost filled up already. Um, and then we have uh, then I have all private work is pretty much all the rest that I do. So when people are trying to select an experiment, you know, um, 
what I'm trying to get them to do is go from almost no evidence or none to to some. And, and so in here, we we kind of have this discovery kind of bucket of experiments in the book where we're talking about, OK, what are the things where we're just doing open ended exploration? We're trying to figure out, uh, are we on to anything at all or any jobs, pains and gains that we're trying to solve for you know, our beneficiaries? And um, a lot of these will probably sound familiar to you all, but like interviews and surveys, of course. But there are other things in here we we included a lot of uh, Luke Homan's work uh, with uh, innovation games, so buy a feature and product box, um, and, and speedboat. There there are also things that might be less obvious, like search trend analysis. Um, so how do you search for a volume and see if, there, if there's people actively trying to um, solve this problem that you you claim that you're going to solve? Um, and, there, and there's other ones. Um, you know, explainer videos, referral programs. So, but the way we did it is we applied the, the the themes of desirable, viable, feasible to them, and some other taxonomy that I'll go into. And, and so you end up with this like selection of, oh, I have this kind of risk. What's available to me? And I thought that was a missing piece because there's plenty of lists of stuff online, but uh, the list of stuff I kept sending to my teams, and they're like, this is a list of stuff. I, I don't know what to do with it. I don't know what to choose. So the list of stuff is not um, super helpful. I found. And then we have uh, validation experiments. And from validation, what we're, we're trying to go from an evidence point of view is from some uh, to strong. So basically, we want to get to uh, a place where we feel like there, there's, there's a significant amount of evidence that we are on the right track before we try to scale something. And usually why things fail is because we try to scale it too soon and didn't really solve a meaningful problem or um, we could it couldn't sustain from a viability point of view. And, you know, I, I know we love throwing this um, kind of uh, term of minimum viable product out a lot, MVP. Um, I tried to write a book without using that term. Uh, it didn't 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 pan out for me. Uh, but. You know, I tend to go back to the kind of original definition that I learned anyway was from Frank Robinson in, in 2001 um, from SyncDev. And then that informed Steve Blank's work and also Eric Ries's work. But now it's it's just everything. Like everything's an MVP. Whatever you want it to be, it's an MVP. It's, it's like opening your wardrobe and going, I have these are all new old clothes or all my new clothes. Like it, it's amazing. Um, like when you talk about org change, and you talk about cultural change and behavior change inside orgs and, and governments, you know, um, you don't necessarily want to take something you were doing before and just call it a new name and, and say, that's it. <laughs> like, check the box, <laughs> have an MVP. So what I tried to do uh, was to um, maybe bring the conversation down a little more detailed. And I say, what types of MVPs do I really see when I'm working with teams? And there, there are a few. Uh, one is concierge. So concierge is doing it manually instead of building anything. Services are really great uh, to do concierge. Um, there are all kinds of different ways that you can just, it doesn't scale. But you do it to learn, and then you take what you've learned and you inform uh, what you've what you can scale. And then I see Wizard of Oz, which is similar to a concierge, but it's not obvious there's a person in the mix. So um, I guess like in startup world, I, I teach a lot of uh, uh, workshops in Silicon Valley still, even virtually. And I'll see all these waves of uh, like AI startups come in, and I always kind of laugh. It's like, oh yeah, you're an AI startup, but you don't have any data scientists and <laughs> basically you have people behind the scenes and spreadsheets just like cranking through stuff and giving it as an output to see if anybody would really care. And so eventually it'll become AI. But right now it's it's just like a bunch of people in spreadsheets. So um, that, that happens quite a bit where you're trying to test the value prop and you want to test a real interaction, but you don't know if it's worth scaling or building the whole thing behind the scenes yet. So you, you kind of do it with people. And then the others I see are um, a single feature. So kind of in the for-profit world, you think of Amazon. I, I feel like the single feature there was the Amazon Dash button. I felt like that was the precursor to a lot of their Alexa strategy. Um, and so they would um, put these buttons. They wanted they wanted the test point of sale away from the screen. And so you would put this button like on your um, washing machine. And then you, you know, it'd say, I, I want to buy detergent, whatever, you know, it's like tied. And then you'd press it and it would just order it. And if you look at um, where we are now, uh, now it's, well, that stuff's baked in because you have a smart washer that talks to Alexa and it just orders the stuff for you. So uh, you no longer need those buttons. But I thought it was a really interesting precursor to some of their um, the strategy away from the screen. 
and and so uh, even even their um, replenishment service is called the Dash replenishment replenishment service. So I feel like that's a really good example of a single feature. It just does one thing, and that's it. And then mashup, um, which I would say is getting really interesting now because of the whole no code movement. Y you have all of this stuff where you can um, essentially build without knowing how to code. And they still have to know the platforms, but I've seen people recreate Uber Eats and Airbnb and uh, all kinds of stuff in like a couple of days using templates. And it all works. You know, <laughs> it's just insane. Uh, I keep thinking of the first startup I joined and we had to literally host our own servers <laughs> beside us under the stairs. <laughs> Those days are long, long gone now. So um, now you can say, well, I could have hired a whole dev team to do this for me, or I could just hire this guy who could do it in a day using templates and it scales for, you know, it'll last you probably like one to two years. Um, I, I, and a more kind of other side of the example, right? I, um, uh, I met the, one of the co-founders of Tesla before uh, the pandemic hit, and it was a very, very informative talk. And I'm really always interested in early days. Um, I, I don't like the stories where they start with all this, you know, f fabrication of what it was like. I love stories for people who were there, you know, and um, his name's his name's Mark. And, and he was talking about the first Tesla and, and what they ended up doing is they used a Lotus Elise chassis. So it was, it was Lotus Elise. And they just like kind of mashed up it up with other parts to make it a, like electric sports car and test it with all their customers. And they did sort of uh, like kind of stealthy testing, I guess, because they weren't really putting it out there. But they were having people drive and sit in it. And they learned a lot of stuff like um, the doors are really difficult uh, and the, the instrument cluster didn't make sense. And the heating mechanism didn't work because it wasn't an internal combustion engine and they had to re, re like refactor things. And they learned quite a bit on just mashing up stuff. Now, if you look at a Tesla today, it looks very different. But if you look early, early Teslas, if you look at the back of them, they still say Lotus. <laughs> it, has a, it has a T logo on, on the on the hood. But if you look at the back, it still says Lotus. I think it's great. Um, but they call that a mule. Uh, M-U-L-E is, is the kind of a name for it. But there, there's mashups in the physical space, too, where you can take physical things and, and mash them up. So. Um, but in reality, all we're trying to do is get people to go from, you know, kind of some evidence to strong. And in that, it's more about, um, hey, we, we have some open-ended kind of directional hypotheses we tested. And now we're trying to see is a real value exchange. And not everything's an MVP. You know, your landing page probably isn't an MVP. Uh, it's great for testing value props and testing maybe a call to action. But unless behind that call to action is, you doing stuff and delivering value back to them, um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't call it an MVP. I, the, the only four I really see are concierge, Wizard of Oz, um, single feature, and mashup. But you know, I, I'm sure there's room for other people to write in this space and create content. So if you have other types of MVPs, great. These are the ones I normally see. Uh, that's a real value exchange that de-risks. And I think we keep need to come back to this conversation about risk in an MVP. It's not just the smallest possible thing to build to get on to building whatever you wanted to build anyway it's very much building to learn and i think um that's where i have trouble with the build measure learn loop because it starts with build and everybody just wants to build right away but you really should like start with learn and what you're trying to learn so um how we approach this in the book and in all my work is we try to apply like a taxonomy to all these different things that we've seen and so i really tried to to make the book um you know, like I was coaching a team, uh, I think it's one of the best advice I got from my editor was just write the book like you're coaching a team. And and so when you look at something like a concierge, you know, if I was working with a team, I would say, OK, well, how much does this cost? It almost costs nothing as far. I mean, it's time, you know, you have to factor in, I guess, salaries, but um, it doesn't cost as far as building a lot of technology or, or trying to automate a bunch of stuff. It's pretty cheap to do. The setup time isn't very long. You just have to lay out what are the steps to create the thing so everyone's on the same page. And the runtime usually isn't very long because you don't try to scale this. This is more of just a small experiment to learn on what it takes to really do this uh, manually. But what I love is the evidence strength is really strong because you're back here behind the scenes kind of creating this thing and then you're delivering it to the, to the customer or the beneficiary. And, and they're actually paying for it. So even though it doesn't scale, um, it, it can have a really great impact on, um, you know, on learning overall risk. 
And so that's when we talk about this overall desirable, viable, feasible risk. I love experiments that are later on in your journey that can test all three. And so I feel that there's just plenty of creativity to tap into with your teams to say, how would we do this at a small scale and learn and get real evidence versus us just either on Zoom calls or my team's calls or uh, in, in a whiteboarding session where we just kind of throw ideas back and forth and we say, of course, this is going to work. And then we just, you know, just build some evidence first to see, is there any observable evidence that we can do this and that people want this and that they'll pay for this and there's a and they're happy with it. And I think doing that at, at small scale is fine. Um, I would say we, we probably don't do that enough. We need to do more things that don't scale early on and then use what we learn to automate uh, later on. So um, basically what I've done for you all here is for those of you who don't have the book, uh, Tendai Vicky, who's um, he's an associate partner at Strategizer and he also wrote um, Pirates in the Navy and the Corporate Startup and there's another one he wrote but he's a really really uh, amazing person and he helped create these um, with a designer create these little cheat sheets to the book and so what i've done in this board is kind of um, put them in here for you all and um i'll have to eventually stop sharing and get you the link to the board here so you can help me out with the, with this exercise but basically um, they're the validation experiments and they're the uh, discovery experiments and so they don't go as deep as the book but if you say like, hey, what's a feature stub? Well, um, what a feature stub is, it's the kind of test of an upcoming feature, but it's just the beginning of the experience. And you don't do it on critical things and you don't do it for very long. So for example, um, I was clicking around in Google, I click a link and it says, oh, we're not ready yet. Can you give us feedback on, on this? That's basically Google saying, well, we don't know if this we should actually build this whole thing out and scale it yet. So let's do some small tests for not very long, for not very many people to see is there any observable evidence that anybody cares at all? Because they're measuring who, who saw this, uh, who clicked on it, and then who gave feedback. And if there's zero people clicking, then they're like, oh, maybe this isn't the right thing to go forward with, or maybe it's in the wrong spot, or maybe we're targeting the wrong people for this. And so it's a good way to kind of break out of that conversation of I think this is a good idea I think this is a bad idea and then there's no evidence so it's just whoever has the highest rank their opinion wins <laughs> and that's never that's never fun so I love injecting evidence into into that conversation so um, what I thought we could do if you're up for it is to um, do do in a sequence together and so one of the things that was really popular in the book was this idea of an experiment sequence and it almost didn't make it in. It, there are only two pages in the book and people would literally hold the book and open it up <laughs> these two pages time and time again. So I'm glad I included it before we rushed out. But um, most of the teams I work with, they do more than one experiment. And, and so what's the idea of um, like what what possibly could we do that um, would you know, learn take what for what we learn one experiment and inform the next experiment. And so I'll, I'll just use um, we'll, we'll just create. Um, well, I'll tell a story of a funny one. Let's do that. So one of the ones that we tested in New York City was called um, <laughs> it, it was um, I'm laughing because it was kind of a silly idea. Uh, it was a dating advice um, chat bot for men. OK, well, uh, if I can spell right. So um, Basically, what this was, was a, a bot that you could uh, text and it would give you advice for uh, for for dates. Now, uh, what happened in the earlier part of the journey for this team, they did a lot of customer interviews. So they, they basically went through and said, OK, well, um, what's dating advice look like now? Where are men going? Where is there um, deficiencies and gaps? They also did some search uh, um, search trend analysis to uh, see beyond the people they um, interviewed were there others that actually it was more of search volume and what you can do with search trend analysis if you went to let's say google trends you could see region you could see seasonality you can see volume um, they did some uh, paper prototyping of what the actual bot could do and how it would work just sketching it out they um, created a landing page and then they um, did something called a Wizard of Oz, which we just spoke about. Now, um, this is so this is a really interesting sequence, right? They said, OK, we're going to interview customers. We're going to use that to inform um, 
our search trend analysis. So what we've heard, can we go and see, is anyone else searching for this, this topic? Then they did some paper prototyping to see, okay, what could this bot possibly do based on what we've learned from interviews and search trends? Then let's spin up, uh, like a, spin up a landing page that has a clear call to action and what it does. It's a SMS bot for, for dating advice for men. And then where it got really creative was they didn't really have a bot. Uh, they just hired a team of women to act like a bot and respond to the men uh, that were texting it. So it's because he didn't know if anybody would say if nobody texts and you already spent millions of dollars building bots, uh, kind of you, there's no way to go with that, uh, that innovation, right? So here's where it went uh, a little um, wrong. Uh, so what happened was uh, they thought almost nobody would sign up for this thing and they had a thousand plus signups in a few hours. Now, what that did was um, this team over here who was um, basically um, really small and trying to um, trying to really relay dating advice to men uh, was completely overwhelmed. And then um, people were going on discussion forums like Hacker News and complaining that even the bot was ignoring them and they were hopeless. So that was not the intent. Um, basically, what happened was they had to change it to a wait list so it wouldn't overwhelm the small team. And... Um, Ultimately, this one was really interesting. I think where it failed was viability because this one failed because uh, it wasn't we didn't fail because it wasn't desirable. Like there were a thousand people texting <laughs> a bot for advice uh, in a few hours. Uh, it was feasible uh, even with a small team, right? Um, you could easily take those requests and then inform a bot and then build that bot based on real world data. So that's not a problem. Um, the viability was where this one struggled. It, it probably could have been funded. But um, it was really hard to say, would people pay a subscription for a dating advice bot? Uh, I don't know. This was several years ago. So maybe people would pay for it now. But um, I doubt it. <laughs> I don't know. It, people pay for all kinds of stuff now. So maybe maybe, uh, maybe I'm wrong. But um, the point I'm trying to make is you take what you've learned from your customer interviews. You use that to inform your search trend analysis. You take what you've learned from that. You inform your paper prototyping. You take what you've learned from that. You inform your landing page. You take that, what you've informed there, and then have a you know, behind the scenes from your call to action of your landing page to deliver value back as a Wizard of Oz. Um, quite often, you use the notes from your customer interviews in your landing page, in your marketing copy, because you're using real quotes from from your customers from the interviews. So I think that's a really fascinating way to approach this. Um, so what I'm going to do is, what I'm going to do is stop sharing for a moment um, and find chat. <laughs> Here we go. Sorry, I've been ignoring chat. We will eventually get to your Q&A at the end here. Um, so this is a mural link. If you click that, that uh, you don't have to register. You can just uh, basically join and you'll be anonymous uh, snail or something. Uh, you just click enter as visitor and it'll pop up a window for you. So, all right. So what I thought might be fun to do, and I see you all coming into the board now, so that's awesome. And you get access to a cool board that has a bunch of experiments on it. So, so it's good, good to join. Um, I'm going to share my screen again. So what I would love for you all to do is if you are working on something that you're willing to share, then um, browse over here to these experiments. And so the way you use Mural is this bottom right is sort of like your navigator here. So if you click the hand, it'll let you like drag the board around. And if you click off, it'll let you do edits. Now, a lot of this stuff's locked down, so don't feel like you're going to mess up the board or anything. Um, but if you double click, it creates a sticky. And I could say, you know, hello, and, and it's just really easy. It's almost like using um, Keynote or PowerPoint at this at this stage. So um, what I thought could be fun is for you all to view the um, the experiments, and you can zoom in using the little plus and minus. So you can zoom in and uh, read the experiments. But I thought what would be fun is for you all to just um, come up with some experiments you think might help what you're working on. And if you're willing to share, cool. We will uh, share out and uh, give you feedback. If not, we can jump into the Q&A. But I thought I would just give you some time with the experiments. And if you have something you're working on, just like I did here with the dating advice uh, chatbot, um, I've had all kinds of different. Uh, one of the ones I did recently had COVID response. So people were coming up with COVID response ideas, and they were they were talking about how they're experimenting through it. Um, there's all kinds of interesting stuff going on in the world right now. So if you have something that you feel like these experiments would help, then uh, I'll give you the space to to create some. So what I'm going to do is put a timer. So Mural has a timer up here in the top. So I'm going to set the timer to five minutes, play some music, and um, 
we will share out after the five minutes and we can also jump into some Q&A. Okay, so five minutes and... minutes left.
All right. So that's seat belt sign uh, sound is awesome. Okay. Um, who? And I might need some help with this because I'm not sure Microsoft Teams. I think you just unmute probably and and just start talking. But um, who would like to share something they came up with with the larger group? I see a couple of sequences here. So we have building uh, interactive agility training and connecting behavior change to living your values and XP coding spike. It looks like something down here. Does anybody uh, want to share out what they came up with? If sure, I'll jump in. Can you hear me? Yeah, David, can, can you hear me? Okay, cool. Uh, my name is Bob. I did the build interactive agility training workshops. It's actually something I'm involved in. I live in North America and I'm working with a series of subsidiaries in Europe that are part of our company and trying to do some basic agility training. Uh, agility with a small a, not uh, agile stuff. And I'm just, you talked about a sequence. I'm, I'm literally doing this right now. I'm doing a couple weeks worth of mural training sessions and then to take some feedback and figure out if the content was interesting and had any value. And then if it, it was, then solicit more content and continuing iterating over it. Um, so. I don't know what we can learn from that, but that's what came to mind when you share that with us. Yeah, no, thank you. I think um, the, the thing is being able to use the evidence you generate and then come back and kind of inform your strategy. Like some things you think might be wildly popular, people might not care about, but they care about some other thing. And then you have to tweak your offering and, and all this. And so um, I always find it fascinating when your ideas and meet other people <laughs> to see because like, when you're inside your head it's, it's it's too easy everything sounds great and and then when you start testing them against reality that's when uh all the unexpected stuff happens it's basically like scientific method applied to business so um yeah so the thing here is really just taking what you've um learned and then uh coming back so it kind of looks linear how we're laying it out but it's very much iterative so you have to come back and kind of uh update based on what you've learned so that's awesome that's awesome that you're testing it out that way i feel like uh yeah even though we're all distributed now you can test out still ideas remotely in ways that maybe we hadn't hadn't considered before so very cool thank you um does anyone else want to share before we jump into q a Oh. I'll jump in here at the uh, at the bottom. It's it's uh, poorly formed than just the initial considerations, but the challenge that I'm dealing with here is one where we've got we're overloaded with stakeholders, uh, influential, consequential stakeholders. So I'm at the I'm at the very bottom, the one without a title <laughs> that has uh, some some stacked processes that starts with survey clients and then web traffic seeking, vacation, etc. The context is that we are working on simplifying the process through which people with criminal convictions vacate their records, uh, clean the records in Washington state. And in that context, we need to not only serve the clients, which are generally one shot clients as opposed to a repeat user context. So, um, uh, and we need to be friendly in the way that we dovetail with prosecutors and courts that are a little arm's length and um, hesitant to engage with us. And then also engage with the, the SMEs, the attorneys that uh, are comfortable navigating this world, but generally are unaffordable. So my thought around here is to survey the clients that we can find, uh, which need to remain anonymous, as well as understanding the web traffic, the way that they articulate their searches. And then uh, interview the, the courts to understand how they want to be engaged with, because they're gonna be on the receiving end of anything that we give them. And so anything we give needs to be properly composed uh, to, to enter into their funnel, as well as engaging with the SMEs to understand their, uh, the way that they have understood navigating the context to validate if automation is even a possibility in this multimedia context where some things are digitized and some things are not. Oh, thank you for sharing. Um, and it's a, it's a great initiative. Um, I've only 
dabbled in in kind of prison reform and and such but i was introduced to uh it from rick clow who used to be at google ventures um and uh there was some in san francisco we had uh, some shared space in our um in our in our office where people came in and, and were uh, released and they were trying to learn to code and, and other things so just having very very limited it, it, you know experience in that realm i feel like um yeah it, it's very tricky because again like you said anonymous right so you, you'd want to keep people anonymous but you're also trying to learn these really quality like valuable qualitative insights from different players um and and then try to use that to inform what you would possibly design and and so i think um you know this this is like taking the practices and really applying them in a, in a context where you can't just uh like throw up a landing page and do some like something that would work with just a, a really popular b2c app right do, does not work in this context so i like the way you're thinking about it um it sounds like you're being very thoughtful and you have all these different players so it's, it's I, I want to say it's like a multi-sided market, but there's many, many different players. I, I think um, where I find help in this world is I kind of go back to to um, Steve Blank's book, Four Steps to Epiphany. He, he goes through this really complicated B2B process um, where, he, where he talks about like the user customer and then the influencer and the recommender and then the economic buyer and then decision maker. And, 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 and so, so much of the complex um, B to G or B to B world is, is um, really navigating all that, all that, and visualize, like trying to visualize it, and then going into how do I break down my risk. So um, yeah, I mean, even though this is like sort of just you know ad hoc, but I, I think it's a really great start to what you could do to de-risk the initiative, and so hopefully you'll find some inspiration in some of these um, techniques uh, for your context. So yeah, thank you, thank you for sharing. Um, okay, so uh, before I jump into Q&A, over here on the right, um, I just added a bunch of free stuff for you all. So how this works is you just double click this image and then it drops into the resources section. And so all my latest writing, I have a write up here um, on the mission model canvas as well. Uh, it's in here somewhere. Um, yeah, this one, how to map risk with a mission model canvas. So it goes through some of the steps and the differences between this and the business model canvas um, and then how I do it. And, and it's basically kind of what I show, showed you today. But if, you, but if you can't watch the video and you just wanted to have a resource to point to, it's on here on my site. And then I have a bunch of other videos and templates, you know, some of the ways that I, I use to facilitate assumptions mapping and, and all that. So, um, yeah, definitely take advantage of the free resources that I have because uh, so much, you know, if you ask really, um, you know, if you, if you start a conversation with me, there's a good chance I would I would point you here anyway at the beginning. So, um, yeah, so we've covered a lot <laughs> in an hour, right? We went from um, design thinking, you know, desired, viable, feasible, framing and who would be in the room to how you layer that over on top of a tool to how you do a two by two to look at your risk to how you match it to an experiment. And we also covered, you know, high level, the taxonomy and some experiments and um, sequences. So quite a bit. Uh, I tend to uh, like over deliver <laughs> in these sessions. So, um, yeah, but I know we have a few minutes left, so um, I haven't been paying attention to chat. So maybe let me uh, close my screen. And then, yeah, what are questions you all have? Maybe I'll start with uh, Farzad. Uh, your, your hand is raised. Yes. Hi, hi everyone. Um... Uh, this is as far as I'm speaking, I'm Canadian, but uh, actually currently in the U.S. Um, I really love the workshop. Thank you so much, David. Um, I was the one who actually came up with the behavior idea to values thing. It's kind of like a, I guess, like a passion project for me of how do you connect your current state you versus the person you want to be um, or the person you want to become. So I guess I'm really curious about the no sort of code stack that you mentioned. Like I'm at a place where I want to prototype more. Uh, with my ideas and see if I can show them to people. And I'm just wondering if you have any suggestions on how to go about that. I'm just the beginning of exploring that side of the equation. Yeah, um, I do have an article I wrote um, recently that's on that website, uh, on, on the prequel site. That it's like the rise of no code MVPs. Uh, I list, I link to Bubble and other different platforms that people are using right now. Bubble is pretty powerful. It, you can, um, when you sign up, even if you're intimidated by the tool, they have freelancers that you can literally hire to build whatever you want. So 
Uh, you, granted, you, you'd have to do your due diligence there, but um, it's surprising how much this space has grown in the last one to two years. Um, the, the last agency I had uh, that had been long part of we were like uh we were like lean startup as an agency so uh we were backed by eric Rees and and uh digital garage and, and um i look at what we did then and that was like five or six years ago uh we had a little team that was working through this if i was do that again i would just do it no code <laughs> like because we were doing all these mvps so um so much has changed in even the last five years so i think um definitely starting with uh so that article i have on my site it, it's one of the top ones check there and then there's links to different no code solutions and then it's more just getting familiar like is it is it up to you to learn these tools do you want to hire somebody to do it for you because uh, some of them have a steep learning curve but bubble adalo there, there's like so many of them now that i feel like there's one launched every week at this point so um definitely check that article out that that should help all right we have, we have another hand up uh, go ahead. Oh, people were asking about the three-day workshop too. Um, let me put the link in here. I'm terrible at, at advertising stuff. So this is the three-day workshop that uh, I'm doing with Alex. It's, um, I think it's next week, or I don't know. <laughs> it's soon. <laughs> All the weeks blur together with me. Uh, if you use this discount, it'll give you uh, a 10% off too. So I think sales are still open for it. So that's the three-day event that I'm doing with Alex based on the book too. So if you all are curious, because I saw the question from uh, Nancy here too. Yeah, I can hang around for a few more minutes if we have other questions, though. Awesome. Uh, I wonder, uh, I, you know, uh, but, uh, began, began, your, your, your hand is raised. Oh, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead and go with the other questions. I took my hand down for a moment. I'll, I'll come back in a little bit. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, yeah, all good. I, I was making sure no one, uh, no one is left, left behind, you know. <laughs> Um, all right, so how about uh, we have one question uh, from Horia. Um, he asks, uh, any insight you could, you could provide to resistance to experimentation in a more traditional, highly structured, um, less open organizations? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> I'm not saying what they may be, but yeah, any, um, any way to, sue it, to inject that uh, and deal with the resistance? Yeah, it's so much of its mindset. And um, again, I, I made this quote the other day about all the tools and templates in the world aren't going to help you if you don't have the right mindset. And so what I try to do is speak in the voice of the customer as much as I can. So, for example, if I'm dealing with stakeholders uh, or a leadership team and uh, I tend not to lead with hypotheses and experiments, I tend to talk about um, de-risking and uh, how we make investments. And, and so I, I just keep thinking about in their world, in their world, and I work with boards and I work with C-suite a lot. They, they're almost, uh, it's not that they don't care about the experiments, but they're all, they're worried about risk and they're worried about, are they spending their money wisely um, and having the impact they want? And so quite often my conversations are, are in that language with them. And you'd, you'd be surprised um, if you just have the right tone and you use the right like language that they, they understand it helps so much because uh, it, it's funny. I wrote a book about experiments and uh, I don't lead with the experiments. <laughs> you know, I, I don't go, here's how we create a falsifiable hypothesis to de-risk. Like, I, I don't think like, they'll just shut me out. And if they think uh, if I pitch a canvas to them, they think I'm more interested in using the canvas than helping them. Right. And, and that's not the point I'm trying to help. So I, I tend to use voice of the customer, use words that they get and then um, basically um, and use the right tone and, and try not to speak past them. Um, that, that's usually, the, I mean, it sounds maybe trivial, but I feel like it helps uh, so much. Awesome, thank you. And may, maybe just uh, a, few, a few more questions, but um, yeah. on the uh, Canvas, uh, there was a question related to, uh, you know, starting uh, on the right side, towards the left side, you know, English style writing is, you know, uh, left, right. Um, I'm wondering, like, is that uh, on purpose or would you like change the canvas to to be start more um, clearly on the, on the other side? Um, 
I personally wouldn't. Uh, if you look at the um, original white paper that Alex Ostwaller published, this tool came out of his PhD thesis on business model ontology at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. And it looked like a system thinking diagram. And and so I think when it came out as a canvas, people then interpret it as, oh, I go right to left or left to right. And if you look at the early days, and that's why I draw usually all over it, it is, it's very much um, uh, the relationships between them. So if, if you have a key resource and you really want to start there, you can. You could start there in that box. And then what I would do is move into what's your value prop, uh, who's your beneficiary, right? Um, really quickly, because if you just have a key resource, it's not um, being um, impactful. Like you, you don't, it's like when you have an invention and you're like, what could this possibly solve? You know, you could do it, but you have a limited amount of time usually. Um, so no, I wouldn't necessarily change it. Although people have, I mean, there's all kinds of canvases out there. <laughs> so uh, I tend to, you know, go for, to the source. And so I, I tend to use the, the business model canvas or the mission model canvas when I'm working with governments. And and that's kind of it. I, I feel like it's less about the tool and more about the conversations and are you helping people see the relationships and things. But um, yeah, there's certainly a lot of customizations out there. But uh, I wouldn't personally change it. You could ask Alex. Uh, I, I'm sure you'd probably get the same answer, though. <laughs> so. All right, great. And uh, any any other questions? Anyone want to raise their hand uh, quickly? We're, we're coming to time. So, you know, uh, what a, uh, I mean, this this hour went by so quickly. It was amazing. Okay, hey, we have one more question. Hey. And, Oh, maybe write it out. Uh, hello, sorry, David. I was just, did someone get cut off? I didn't want to just take their place. I just had a quick question about like connecting with communities of people who are doing this kind of thing. Uh, I'm kind of looking for that right now. I was wondering if you had any sort of like pointers or suggestions in that regard. Um, community as far as this work, I, I think, you know, the strategizer community is a great place to start. Um, there is a coaching program that I'm helping out with right now where it's taking people who want to become coaches and um, really applying the methodology. Uh, I think Andy runs that program. So if you just I, I put my contact information in there, if you want to just DM me um, on LinkedIn or something, I can show you the connection to to Andy. Um, and then overall, yeah, I wish there were more. I mean, Lean Startup Movement's been around about 10 years now, and Design Thinking's been around a lot longer than that. And I feel like we're still in the early adopter phase. Um, so I think the book helps, right? Like the book is probably like top 5% business books right now. So it's selling really well, and I think it's helping get the word out. But um, there, there's a lot of room for <laughs> more practitioners in this space. So I would start with Strategizer, but... Um, yeah, just just hit me up. There's not like a, a one community I would point you to other than other than uh, other than Strategizer at the moment. Hey, and of course this community. You know? Yeah, and, and this community, of course. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we're about that time, and um, I uh, yeah, I think just to uh, wrap it up here is that that's okay with everyone. Um, we will be sharing the recording out, um, and. Yeah, uh, sharing all the links. We'll be sharing all the things. Uh, so you're gonna get an email from me. Uh, I don't know, sometime uh, later today or or you know whatever. And yeah, um, we have a couple events coming up. So Canadian Digital Service, uh, it's a government showcase. Uh, we're having that um, on the 27th. And then hey, one week later, we're gonna see what Israel's doing um, and see how they how they do innovation. And, uh, I've heard great things from them. So. Uh, on, on June 1st. So a lot of cool things. Uh, of course, we will, uh, it's all managed through the meetup site. Just want to thank you again, David. Uh, you know, I love uh, hearing your stuff. Um, this was just kind of a cockamamie way to me, for me to see one of your presentations. <laughs> so thanks for everyone coming and allowing me just to see uh, this great stuff. And uh, yeah, thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thank thanks you. for having me. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.